Meded says, why are humans a sexually dimorphic species instead of other species where males and females look and behave very similarly? Do you think the selection pressure which created this is diminished <coughs> in modern times, making the distinction between male and female less important? What do you think males and females bring to the table to society that's unique to each gender? Um, <clears throat> and the unity of knowledge says, JF taught me to make babies. I haven't made babies, but now it is the goal. It wasn't before JF said it a million times. <laughs> See, I'm very happy about this. Um, so humans are a sexually dimorphic species, like most species. Most species are sexually dimorphic. Ch just take the plants. I mean, they are sexually dimorphic and their lifestyle is so different from us. It allows you to see that there is a truth to sexual dimorphism that, that transcends the, the local uh, civilizational matters or was our tribe organized in one way or another. Nature doesn't give a shit. Nature has made sexual dimorphism the standard in plants, in uh, mammals, in vertebrates in general. So what are the conditions under which, uh, to that extent, you might actually ask, the, the special conditions are probably those in which sexual dimorphism disappears. Sexual dimorphism is probably the default. It is the default for a simple fact, the fact that one side of the sexual dichotomy must be delivering the necessary parental care, and as long as this necessary parental care is necessary for survival, <coughs> there will be an asymmetry in the ability of one parent to ensure that it gets transmitted and to the other parent to optionally be transmitting it because there is a bearer of the child. And when I say parental care, by the way, I include the entirety of the uterus, the, the egg production, all of the efforts being de deployed during the embryo life stage, and after, during the caring, the education, etc., as long as all of this is there, and as long as there is an asymmetry in who can deliver it and who is the closest to deliver it, the, advent, the asymmetry here clearly being to the benefit of the female, well, benefit, that the female is, is de deploying much more energetic uh, deployment during the whole embryo stage. And after the embryo stage, well, the male therefore can deliver as much, but given that the female has already committed so much effort, she is the most likely deliverer of the rest also. On top of it, you have that in humanity, there is a, there is a need for intertribal relationship in the form of trade resource gathering, and politics, and war. And so because, because uh, you have this disequilibrium between these two things, on the one hand, nature pushing women to deliver more energy to the baby-making education and parental care, and on the other hand, this other job, which couldn't have been performed as well by females because of the muscle problem, if you will, then you have a pressure for not only females to be caretakers, but for males to specialize in something else, for males to specialize in hunting, strategy, war, and interactions with other tribes, alliances, and trade. <clears throat> what could be then your question, so, so that's the, the tribal state of humanity. 
Uh, Rodila Sid says she is also the provider of milk. Exactly, the energy in milk. So then your question becomes... Um, do you think the selection pressure is diminished in modern times? You may have the illusion that it's happening because you have all this, you know, desexification, degenderification of the public space the search for equilibrium on the job market between females and males. But the question remains, are these women who subscribe to this modern mode of life making more babies than those who don't? And as long as they don't, as long as we have a an asymmetry in the reproductive output, for example, a, a woman who does not go to university and does not pursue an extensive career, but takes whatever job is available here and there when she needs money, this woman will probably produce more babies till as of today. So no matter the social force and the cultural force of the combating of the sexual dimorphism of humans, nothing can be strong enough to under to, to undermine the evolutionary pressure at play. You, you can pay a woman to be pregnant through the state, and you can make the job market all adjusted to providing an equal treatment of women and males. In the end, if the women who don't subscribe to this lifestyle and just take your money from the state when you pay them to be pregnant, and on the other hand, don't go out and develop career, and they end up therefore making more babies, you're not going to undermine the sexual dimorphism of humanity. You're going to favor it. Another thing that you see a lot in those LGBT activist circles, you have a trend to be using self-intervention to obliterate and hide the sexual dimorphism. You'll have a woman who start to dress and make their makeup a little more masculine. And you'll have males becoming more feminine and dressing more feminine and using makeup in a feminine way. This also is a social pressure that can become as strong as you want. It won't ever keep nature from converging back to sexual dimorphism for the simple reason that the people who engage in these behaviors are less likely to be attractive on the, the sexual market, are less likely to make babies, and therefore the big winner of the evolutionary race is just the male who acts like the social model of the male, which is to be strong, to be provider, to be, to not wear makeup, to not act in feminine ways. Because this guy still as of today, even in a, in a society that starts hating them, they still perform better on the sexual market. Same thing for the woman who cares for appearance, remains thin, and uh, uses makeup. She still scores better on the sexual market. So no matter how far the, the social pressure, it's a hypocritical pressure. We are not headed toward a genderless world. Unle unless we start playing with our genes, then we are. But as long as we're playing with our phenotypes, we're going to converge back again, again and again, toward absolute dichotomous sexual behavior.